When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the temples of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, Jesus. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you so much for what it teaches us about you and through it, it teaches us about ourselves. Thank you that it's a mirror into our own lives. And I pray, Lord God, now that you would bless and anoint Ruth as she shares what you have put on her heart for us. We just pray that you would give her freedom and liberty in your spirit and uh, give us ears to hear what it is you're saying to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, you know those Sunday mornings when you get up and go to church and you get there and the pianist is preaching? It cannot be a good thing, right? Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for the ways that you speak to us. Thank you that you speak to us through the wordless beauty of nature, through the, the wordless love that we share when we come together. And God, thank you that you speak to us in words as well. Please speak through me this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, buckle up. The first four books of the New Testament, which we call the Gospels, were written by four different people. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Four different people, different histories, different backgrounds, different perspectives, different experiences. In addition to that, <clears throat> they were each writing with a different audience in mind. When they wrote what they wrote, they had a, different expectations of who was going to be reading what they wrote. Uh, Matthew, for example, was a Jewish writer. He was writing to a Jewish audience. So the things that he emphasized were uh, the connections and contrasts between how Jesus lived and what he said, and Jewish expectations in Jewish history. Uh, Mark was a Jewish writer who, interestingly, was writing to a Roman audience. He expected Roman people to be reading what he wrote. So he emphasized things like action and strength and decisiveness in Jesus. Luke was a Greek writer, and he understood the Greek mind well enough to know that Greek people appreciated wisdom and insight and certain kinds of philosophy. So you see that coming out in his writing. And John, you got to love John. I mean, John wrote from the heart with passion and uh, he just, he wrote for anybody that would listen to him because he just loved Jesus and he wanted people to know. So we have basically four reporters telling the same story about the same person, but in different ways. And uh, we can set them side by side and see how they overlap with each other, how they intersect with each other, how they parallel each other. But I find it really interesting how few things that Jesus said and did appear in all four of the accounts of his life. There are a lot of things that are in one, in two, in three. Very few things turn up in all four accounts. The story that we're looking at this morning, Jesus clearing the temple, is one of the exceptions to that. It actually appears in all four. So I mean, you gotta think that, that this made an impression. Of the four versions, I've chosen Matthew this morning to, uh, to focus on, and I have a few different reasons for that. One is that uh, Matthew was just like one of Jesus' A-list crew. He was one of the original 12 disciples that, uh, that Jesus called to follow him and to learn firsthand. Um, another reason is there are things in Matthew's history that I think connect in a remarkable way with what happened in the temple. And uh, we'll come back to that. I think he would have had an interesting perspective on this. 
And his is also the briefest. His has the fewest details. There's really not a lot of information here. Just before this, Matthew writes the story of Jesus' triumphant arrival in, in Jerusalem. And it's full of detail and color and passion and, and emotion and, you know, who said what and who went where and how many of this and, and what did Jesus say and what did they say and what questions did they ask and who put what where. And it's all these details. And then we get to the clearing of the temple and it's just like, okay, we went to the temple and there, there were these tables and like yada, yada, yada. And then he moves on to the next story and he's like, back to the details again. So when he's talking about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, it's full of colors and textures and emotions, and he paints the picture in, in, in big strokes. But when he tells this story, he pulls way, way back, and he becomes very concise. And it's just like short strokes and one color. And then he's back to the big pictures again, which for me puts a sort of a frame around this event. And I think Matthew was only including the details that he thought were the very most important. I mean, for example, Mark talks about the fact that Jesus prevented people from carrying through the temple, carrying things through the temple, which um, was a tradition, not a law, but a tradition that uh, Jewish people would not use the temple as a shortcut from one part of town to another, because again, yeah, that's not very respectful. Mark and Luke are a lot more um, forthcoming about the reaction of the priests, um, how angry they were, and saying that that because of Jesus, what Jesus did in the temple that day, they wanted to kill him. Uh, Luke tells us that Jesus that week was there every day in the temple teaching. Matthew doesn't mention that. Um, John talks about the fact that there were sheep and cows in the temple. You know, Matthew somehow manages to overlook the sheep and the cows. And John is the only one who mentions the whip. So what does Matthew tell us? He says, Jesus entered the temple complex. Now, we have nothing like the temple. We, we have nothing in our culture. We have nothing in our identity as a nation. Nothing in our history that is like the temple. The temple was a massive and famously beautiful building, way up on a hill. You could see it from a distance. You had to climb the hill and climb the stairs to enter this space that was set aside for God. Uh, it was built based on a design that God had actually dictated to Moses thousands of years ago when um, the Israelites were wandering in the desert, and they needed a, a, a portable building that provided them with an anchor, a connection point, that reminded them that God was with them wherever they went. The temple was a place where generations and generations and generations of Jewish people had come to meet with God and to say thank you, and to say I'm sorry, and to say please forgive me, and to say I am yours, and to make those declarations concrete and memorable with sacrifices of money or food or animals. I love this quote from, uh, from an ancient writer writing about the temple. Just let this kind of soak into your brain. This is how the Jewish nation saw the temple, okay? The nation of Israel is the navel of the world. Jerusalem is at its center. The temple is at the center of Jerusalem, and the Holy of Holies is at the center of the temple, and at the center of the Holy of Holies is the Holy Ark, and in front of the Holy Ark, this is amazing, in front of the Holy Ark is the foundation stone on which the world was founded. We have nothing that we value and understand the way the Jewish people loved the temple. Jesus went into the temple complex and drove out all those buying and selling in the temple. Now, nobody actually says this in the text, but we infer from everything that happens that this happened in what was called the court of the Gentiles. So according to the, the, the quote that I just read, the, the temple was built in increasing levels of exclusivity. The further you went in, the fewer people were allowed to go. The court of the Gentiles was a big open space but it was the only place where non-Jewish people were allowed to go in the temple. It was a space that was provided for newcomers who did not yet know God, um, people who were far from home. 
It would give them a chance to listen to the debates that went on between the teachers of the law and the scripture and to ask their own questions and to hear that God had something to say to them, even though they were outsiders. So this space had been set aside, but the people in charge, you know, anybody that's in charge of anything tends to be sort of like a practically minded person, which is probably a good thing. And they decided that that space could be put to a practical use. So they set up a market for visitors where they could buy the things that they needed for their activities at the temple. Now, there were other places in Jerusalem where you could buy animals and buy what you needed for at the temple, but there were advantages to buying things at the temple. One was just that it was convenient. It was one less place to go. It's like you you go to Walmart and get everything instead of having to go to three stores. Same idea. It was convenient. Plus, there was the, the more significant fact that animals that were brought to the temple for a sacrifice had to be, in the words of, of the original law, flawless. They had to be without flaw. No injuries, no sores, no dirt. They had to be perfect. So you can imagine, you know, going across town, buying a sheep, leading it through the crowd. You know, but what are the odds that by the time you get to the temple, it's not going to be flawless anymore? So, you know, practically speaking, that was probably a, a good, good move. Um, but, you know, human nature, we love convenience, and uh, we're willing to pay a little bit more for convenience. So um, the people who were selling, buying and selling in the temple had hiked the price. They were kind of profiteering a little bit, which is ethically a bit iffy. Jesus drove out all those buying and selling in the temple. He overturned the money changers' tables. This is where I find it really interesting to look at this through Matthew's eyes. Money changers were, again, providing a service. They were converting foreign coins, which were not acceptable at the temple, to a particular coin, a very specific coin, that was used to pay an annual temple tax by every Jewish man. Um, It was required. We see Jesus and Peter earlier in Matthew paying the same tax and needing to get this same coin. It had to be that particular one. And again, human nature coming into play. When you have a captive audience, you have the temptation to, you know, just add a little bit on the top. And that's what was happening. The, uh, the people in the temple were inflating the exchange rate and uh, charging people more than the coin was worth. And they were making money on this requirement that God had set for his people. So what I find interesting is before Jesus called Matthew, before Matthew began this new life, he was a tax collector. He was a tax collector for the Roman government, not for the temple. But it was the same kind of situation. The the Jewish people who collected taxes for the Roman government would charge their neighbors and families and countrymen and strangers way over the top. They would charge them far more than what the Romans were going to take from what they collected, and these people would become quite well off. Being a tax collector, you know, you got to be rich, but you were, like, (laughs) profoundly unpopular because you were ripping off your your own people to give money to the invaders. When when Matthew looked at these guys sitting at these tables in the temple, you got to wonder what he thought. What you know? What did he see there? What did he think? Did he consider that you know this was a kind of work? This was a mindset that Jesus had called him away from. And if Jesus had not called him away, would he still be sitting at his little table, ripping people off? I just find that really kind of interesting. Jesus overturned the money changers' tables and the chairs of those selling doves. Again, um, Matthew does not mention the big smelly sheep and the big noisy cows. He just mentions the doves. So what's with the doves? What does Matthew have against doves? Matthew doesn't have anything against doves. Doves are cute. But way back when, when God was first uh, establishing the law, first giving instruction for how this was going to work with sacrifices, Uh, He gave very specific instructions for specific sacrifices. And generally, the way it worked was um, you bring a cow or a sheep or a certain amount of produce, and that's your sacrifice. But over and over and over again, God provides 
an exception. He says, do it this way, but if you can't afford that, do it this way. And the substitution is doves. The doves were the sacrifice of people who could not afford first choice. It was the sacrifice of the poor. And this is historically supported by, by um, at least one writer, that the prices of doves in the temple were inflated by as much as 20 times. So like if you went somewhere else in town and you bought a dove, you'd pay a dollar. You come to the temple, you buy a dove, you're paying 20. So these guys are, they're ripping off poor people. I mean, we can, we can talk ourselves into anything, justify anything in our own behavior. And uh, that's what these guys were doing. We, we get to this point of my, uh, place in our heads where we can say, well, you know, that's what God said, but, which rings a bit of a bell. So, so far what we see happening in the court of the Gentiles space is that opportunity to connect with God is being taken away from newcomers and the poor are being ripped off and God's intentions are being undermined. And we see that even more in the next section, which is like maybe my favorite section of this whole thing. Jesus said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Now, this is, this is geek stuff here, so bear with me. Now, the way Matthew quotes Jesus here, what Jesus is using in his announcement is, is a device called a remez. And a remez was something that was common in the debates between rabbis and teachers, and they would, they would throw these things back and forth with each other. And the best example I could come up with for a remez, if we were using one today, is this. So if I were to say to you, hey, what day are you going to buy me lunch? And you were to reply to me, TGI. And I would say, okay, see you then. What day are we having lunch? Friday, there we go, TGI, because we know that TGI is followed by F. Thank goodness it's Friday. I know that, you know that, it's part of our idiom, it's part of our culture. But TGI is not information. TGI is not the answer to my question. What you've done is actually set me a riddle to solve. And when I have solved the riddle, when I have filled in the blank, then I have my answer. And that's what Jesus was doing here. This is the blank that the, uh, the priests and Pharisees would have filled in when they heard Jesus say this from the book of Isaiah. I will bring them from the nations to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations for all nations, for Israel and everybody else. This goes way back to uh, when God was first establishing the roots of the, uh, of the Jewish nation. He started with Abram, and uh, he said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. The journey that Abram began that day was the beginning of a blessing for the entire earth, for all nations, all peoples, Jews and Gentiles. But here was the court of Gentiles, filled with animals and noise and smells and furniture and greed. So Jesus takes a stand. He stands on that ground and he says, enough. This has to stop. The foreigners, the outsiders, the poor, they have come this far to meet me and you will not hinder them. Now it's clear at this point that Jesus knows what is going to happen to the temple. It's clear that he knows that within 30 or 35 years, there will be 
no more temple. That a time will come when the powerful Roman nation will have had enough of the, uh, the scrappy Jewish nation and they will invade and besiege Jerusalem and kill hundreds of thousands of people and tear down the temple. That they'll come in and they'll take those huge, massive blocks of, of beautiful white stone and just haul them apart like a bunch of Lego pieces and throw them down a hill. And there will be no more temple, no more sacrificial system, no more holy of holies. So what was the point? What was the point of Jesus making all this fuss? What was the point of him making all this mess? What was the point of him annoying people to the point where they wanted to kill him? Well, for us today, the point that we can take away from this begins here. The Apostle Paul writes these words. Don't you know, your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you and whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The word sanctuary in there is the same word as the temple. We are, in God's eyes, that temple. Your body, your own personal collection of bones and muscles, your hands and your eyes, and your heart and your voice. You are the center of the center of the center of the earth. You are designed by God as a place where you can meet him and carry him through the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was good, and we lived in the center of the center of the center of the earth, in the place that he designed for us, where he would come and meet with us, and we didn't have to go looking for him. But with, you know, just a few words from hissy McHissy face over there, we talked ourselves into believing God is not the boss of me. He loves me and he wants me to be happy. And I will be happier and more fulfilled if I just do what feels good. So we did what felt good, and suddenly we found ourselves hiding what we'd done, hiding behind leaves and under any convenient rock. And we still do the same thing today. We still talk ourselves into damaging and unacceptable behavior and attitudes that come between us and God. We fill our minds and our hearts with the clutter and the noise and the smells of our culture, with our self-importance and our pride. And there, in the middle of us, in the middle of you, in the middle of me, stands Jesus saying, enough. You are my temple. You are my sanctuary and my house. You are a house of prayer for all. Do not turn it into a temple to yourself. And when he allowed himself to be nailed to the cross, he did so carrying away our pride, carrying our self-delusion, carrying our self-aggrandizement, and our self-justification. When we say yes to Jesus, when, like the people who came to the temple, we say, thank you, I'm sorry, forgive me, I'm yours. When we say yes to that, we give him space to work within us, to overturn what needs to be overturned, to rearrange what needs to be rearranged, and to turn us into something that looks just like him. And I come back to Matthew. Matthew, who had been called away from the old life to the new life. I come back to him standing in the temple, looking at the buyers and the sellers and the money changers. I picture him standing just off to one side, out of the frame, watching Jesus, watching what he does. 
I picture him remembering where he had been, where he had come from, and where he was now, and where he was headed. I picture him watching Jesus and thinking, thank you. I'm sorry. You've forgiven me. And I am yours. And Heavenly Father, that's my prayer this morning. I say thank you. Because I know that you have forgiven me. And I know that I am yours. But I know how easy it is for me to start talking myself into things, to letting my mind wander, to listening to the whispers and the hissing, and to get distracted and off track. God, I pray for myself and for anyone who calls themselves by your name as your follower. Take a stand in us. Stand in that space. Overturn what must be overturned. Rearrange what has to be rearranged. And make us look just like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.